and welcome once again to Calimera USA. Today's special guest is award-winning film director Maria Iliu. After studying literature and philosophy in Italy, she turned her attention to filmmaking and in 1988 won a scholarship enabling her to continue her film studies in Rome while simultaneously working on full-length feature films as the assistant director of Giuseppe and Bernardo Bertolucci. In 2012, Maria presented her documentary, Smyrna, the Destruction of a Cosmopolitan City, 1900 to 1922, at the Vinaki Museum in Greece and last year in New York City. She's joining us today to talk about part two of the documentary, entitled From Both Sides of the Aegean, which will be showcased in Manhattan at the Quad Cinema. Maria, welcome to our show, and what a pleasure to have you here again to talk about your wonderful documentary. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you. It is a very touchy uh, topic of which you happen to touch upon in such a balanced way and uh, in an unbiased way. Uh, and, you know, coming from Micrasiatica, as it is, as my grandmother was. Uh, you as well? Yes. I wanted to ask you if you had, if you have any roots. Oh, yes. Uh, twice, actually, because I grew up with two fathers. Oh. My, my real father was from Smyrna, wow. and he passed away when I was very young, and I grew up with a second father that was great. Oh, wonderful. And he was from Pontos. Oh. He was from Kerasus. Oh, so somehow those two films belong to each of my fathers. Oh. Well, and you did such a wonderful job. <coughs> so has this been a lifelong mission of yours? Did you Were you intrigued well, by the stories that you probably I mean, heard from your You know, I've been working family. on so many different projects and there are so many different things I'd like to go yeah, to do. Yes, of course, at the back of my mind, those two projects were always existing. But it all started in 2007 when we were presenting another film at the Benaiki Museum that has been presented also here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's called The Journey, The Greek-American Dream. It's about the, uh, the life and the immigration of the Greeks in the United States. And we were presenting that uh, at Benaiki, and it was very, very successful. And then the director of the museum, Angelos Del Vorias, asked me, well, what's going to be the next project? And I told him, what about Smyrna? And he said, oh, great. His family is as well from Smyrna. Oh, wow. And uh, I had then this idea because when we were working, uh, trying to find photographs about for, for the journey, yeah. we found in some archives some very interesting photographs that had to do with Smyrna and had to do as well with the exchange of populations. And, um, and I then thought, my God, maybe if we could find more materials because they were completely unknown, we could probably narrate that story in a completely different way because then... In this case, we could, we could save those photographs, we could preserve them and the films as well, and then we could bring new materials that the people have never seen, that they've been locked in cupboards for more than 90 years. Yes. And probably we could also narrate the story with a different point of view. Well, that's wonderful. Through the journey, the Greek-American uh, dream, you uh, were inspired through, I guess, the information that you were finding from or, uh, people coming from Asia Minor. Tell us about that. Well, yes, because when we were doing research for the journey, we were also asking what we have about Greek hi history in every archive we've been. So we had an idea about what was existing when we finished the journey. So when we started with uh, the Smyrna film and this second film, because we developed them together, uh, at the beginning we've been very lucky. We found lots of materials and then suddenly we couldn't find anything anymore. And we were horrified. We couldn't find materials. And then I realized that lots of those materials were completely unprocessed. For example, imagine the Library of Congress. It wasn't the priority in the Library of Congress right. to pro pro really to preserve all those materials that had to do with uh, the Ottoman Empire and Asia Minor because they had so much work to do. So we had already a very good relation with the people at the, at the library. So I asked for a special permission. And we got this permission, so we were able to see the unprocessed materials of the Ottoman Empire that were never opened, photographs that the nobody had amazing. seen, yeah. and footage for lots of years. And uh, it was very moving, actually. I worked with uh, Franji Alexander that is working at the library, and we, we've been working together for a long while. And it was very moving because you could see those little photographs that were completely in pieces that slowly, slowly we preserved. and. Uh, we were helping them to identify them, and they were giving us the permission to use them. Right. And then it's, you know, from the one archive, we've, uh, we, we were getting information for another archive, and then for another archive. 
And the same experience as with the Library of Congress, we had the same experience also with another um, very important archive, um, the Near East Re Relief was a very important foundation that did a great work in Asia Minor and as well in Greece for the refugees when the first came in, in 22. And uh, now this archive is at the Rockefeller Archive in Terrytown, and uh, it just opened um, when we were working on the film. And then there with uh, Michelle Hitzlick again, we had the opportunity to go through those closed boxes that were opening for the first time. Imagine um, a place near the river at Terrytown, a beautiful building where the Rockefeller family never lived, but it has been used as an archive. And those boxes have been there closed for For lots ages, of years. no one has ever uh, <coughs> looked into them. And, and I was going to ask you about your, the information. How hard was it, when you took upon this project, how hard was it to gather the information? And not only just information, the right information, the political information, uh, stories from uh, witnesses or witnessed accounts written somewhere. Well, the, the question is very interesting because indeed everything has been done in three different stages. For example, one of them was the research of those materials, of the photographs and films. And this was not only the, in the United States, this was in Europe, this was in, in London, this was in France, this was in Italy, this was in Greece, in, in Vienna, in Turkey. So we've been working with lots of researchers trying to, to find those photographs and films. Did you find anything from Turkey? Yes, of course, we found also materials from Turkey. And then, uh, simultaneously, I was working with our historian, Alexander Kitrev. He's teaching at Haverford. Actually, my, my crew the last 15 years is always the same. We're working the same people together, which, which is great, which yeah. is a great luck for me because we, we know each other and we grow up together. So with Alexander, we had worked already for two different projects. And we've been talking and thinking about this film that will be opening in a few days here from both sides of the Aegean how to present the story, how to find a completely new way to present the story, because all the films we had seen about the expulsion and the change were feeling that were not really objective. So we didn't want... They were biased. Yes. We didn't want to narrate the story in a nationalistic way, but we did want to narrate the story in an objective way. And we also were feeling that we had to somehow pay tribute really to pay tribute to all those people that lost their lives and their homes. Of course. The Greeks so, and the Armenians. The Greeks and the Armenians. And also... Was there a Jewish to, population to, at all? No. Not, that, this has not to do with the change of populations. Right. But also we felt that, you know, pain is something universal. And, uh, of course, our people, the Greeks, the, the, the Orthodox Christians that have been expelled from the Ottoman Empire, went through terrible hardships and, um, you know, there have been massacres and terrible things happened. But Homeless. also the Muslims that yeah. left from Greece, even though they left in a more easy way because they were just changed, but there were also the 400,000 people that lost their homes. So we really wanted, we have, for example, 1.200,000 Christians <laughs> that lost their homes and... Uh, were treated in an incredible way and they were expelled from Asia Minor. And then uh, there is this decision at the Lausanne Treaty that 400,000 Muslims have to leave from Greece and go back to Turkey. And by studying the story, it's unbelievable. We found patterns that were common. For example, when the Greeks from Asia Minor came in Greece, the way the Greeks treated them was horrible. They, they, they were called... Uh, Pros fingers or, you know, pastrikes, the, the women, turkospori. And, uh, and those people transformed forever what Greece was because yes. they were people that were much more educated. They had incredible skills, so they were much more advanced from the Greeks. Yeah. They were bringing a different culture with them. And they, they, they brought so many things that had to do not only with economy, but also with literature, philosophy, poetry, Think. It was a small Yorgos Seferi, a Nobel. He's coming from Asia Minor. He's coming from Smyrna, very close from Smyrna. So, and we found the same patterns in relation with the Muslims. For example, when the Muslims were arriving in Turkey, they were treated in a horrible way, and they they were obliged not to speak any more Greek because they were speaking Greek. They were not speaking Turkish, 
And lots of the Greeks that came in Greece were speaking Turkish, for example, the people from Cappadocia. And it was not permitted for them to speak in Turkish. So it was very moving. That's now the, the, the third element that comes now as an answer to your question, because one element was the archival material. Uh, then the second step, or simultaneously, we're working with Alexander to see which would be this new way of presenting the story. And then, simultaneously, I was meeting people, refugees, first, second, and third generation, in Greece and in Turkey and everywhere around the world, trying to figure out who would be in the film. And uh, this has been an incredible adventure for me, because I traveled in Crete, I traveled in northern Greece, I traveled in, in Turkey everywhere, and uh, some of them were also here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So there is a very moving story. We met um, Kailopi Georgiadou that lives in northern Greece, and she's from Cappadocia. Now, she's a third generation. And we asked her, where would you like to, to get, have the interview? And she said, well, if you're going to shoot in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, yes, I would prefer to come there. So she came in Halki, where the Turkish refugees were interviewed. And uh, as she was speaking in Greece, suddenly by mistake, she spoke in Turkish. And I said, oh, Kayopi, could you continue your interview in Turkish? And she said, usually I'm not allowed to speak in Turkish, but could I? So she speaks in Greece and then in Greek, and then she speaks in Turkey in Turkish, and uh, she's speaking about the old cut country, Eskimel Meket, and this is Cappadocia for her. And then we got an interview with um, from a Turkish man, Husnu Karaman, very very nice man. He's living in Chesme, and suddenly he spoke a little bit of Greek, and I said, "Oh, Husnu, can you speak in Greek?" He said, "Yes, of course, I can speak in Cretan." So he's speaking in Cretan, and he speaks about Ipaya Patrida, and this is for him, Miraclio. Yeah. And, and you see really that, and, 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 and I really feel, I mean, now it's 90 years later, it's, it's very important that we'll be able to narrate our stories from both sides of the Aegean, and to narrate one tale, one objective tale, and not two different stories that don't match. Unfortunately, yeah, people are caught up within the political... Uh, now, upheaval. of course, it's important to remember that it's not the same. I mean, what happened to the Greeks was quite different. Because Absolutely. So, and, and there is a first part of the film, and this is where we have um, San Ohalo. Do you remember the, the famous book about the Pontian genocide yes. that her daughter Thea wrote? And it's, it's very moving because she came to speak. And I mean, she's a lady that is almost 100 years old now. When we shot the film, she was maybe 98, 97. She was so bright, and she speaks so, it's, it's so captivating the way she narrates what happened to her. So this is another part of the film which is very important, as well as the narration of uh, Haris Psomiadis that passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. He was teaching at Queen's. What was your view before starting this project and after finding out so much information and meeting all these people and understanding what really happened within the political realm of this situation. What is your view today on what happened? It's, it's very interesting because my view changed during the progress of, of working on the film. For example, you know, as I grew up in a, in a family that was a, a branch of my family is from Athens, another one is from Kefalonia, and the third one is from Asia Minor. And my two dads were very present in my education in our home. And uh, so I was growing up with uh, the drama, on, on the one hand, of what had happened to us, but also, you know, with this uh, cosmopolitan atmosphere and the joie de vivre and all those things that people from Asia Minor bring with them, with um, really the pleasure of life. And uh, I, was, uh, I was mainly knowing the story from our part. And then, you know, later on studying in Italy and, and working in other countries and doing research because I was always interested in the topic. For example, in, in Geneva, when you go to the Red Cross archive, then I started realizing that also with the Muslims, the, the story was not very easy, that the Greek army, when it was retreating, really burned lots of Muslim villages, really killed Muslim, lots of Muslims. So it's not the same because the Greeks really went through incredible hardships, but still there are bits and pieces of that history that were not taught when we were kids at the school. Were these under the uh, orders and, of... And of course the same is happening in, in Turkey and even worse. For example, we have a Turkish historian, which is called Chagla Keder. 
He's very famous in the United States and very famous in Turkey. He's teaching in, in Istanbul at the university, at the state university. And he, he explains in the film how in the history books in Turkey, the kids don't learn that centuries before Greeks were living in that country and for centuries and centuries. And it seems that this was Asia Minor, that was a vacant place where suddenly the Turks came and occupied nothing. Nothing. Uh, they started everything from scratch when that's not the case. Yes. So of Propaganda, course last, basically. Of, of course the last years this is this is changing slowly, slowly. So our film is is a is a film that has nothing to do with propaganda. It's a film that is narrating really the story as Truth. it unfolds in I think in a very human way. Well, uh, for those who have not seen part one, I don't know where they could possibly uh, pick up uh, part one before they pick up part two. On part two. Well, lots of people have seen it. Well, the, the film has been, uh, Smyrna has been played in so many different cities. and uh, Can they see it online on YouTube? No, we okay. can't see it online, but we will have the DVD hopefully in, in October. Wonderful. Or not uh, earlier, maybe. And uh, actually, Smyrna, uh, thanks to a grant uh, to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, has been played to 22 universities Wonderful. in the U.S. and Canada, which was great because students from all around the world have, have known the story and then the story slowly, slowly came back to the curriculum. Actually, I would like to add that I'm very grateful to all the people I'm working with. I'd like to mention again Alexander Kitroev and Alan Moore, which is a uh, our photographer, and John Zeka and Aliki Panagi that does the editing, and Nikos Platirakos that does always the music, very beautiful music. And uh, I'd like also to thank very much uh, our donors. Uh, actually, Buras Foundation has been very important for us for, for funding the film. And unfortunately, Mr. Buras is not anymore with us. Bodosakis Foundation, um, the Parliament TV channel. And I would also like to thank very much Stamatis Gikas and Jimmy Demetro, yes. the New York City Greek Film Festival, because uh, this film is uh, supported and presented at the Quad for a two weeks run, five times a day, uh, thanks to the support of uh, the New York City Greek Film Festival. Uh, for those of you who have not seen Zmirna, the Destruction of a Cosmopolitan City, please try and find it or f find where they can... Where well, can it's very easy through our website, which is uh, smyrnadocumentary.org. They can find out when the DVD will be ready, and it will be ready in October, November, we hope. And do not miss from both sides of the Aegean, because this is the part two, the sequel. Uh, they're both wonder, I'm very excited to, to see it. And uh, it is an unbiased view. She presents facts and information uh, on a topic that has not been, I think, presented enough. And uh, I would like to thank you personally also on behalf of my family who wants these stories to be told. And I'm sure uh, many uh, Greeks uh, that uh, are descendants of uh, Asia Minor uh, would are very happy with all the wonderful work that you're doing, and we, we like, you know, we commend you. It's fabulous work, and Thank keep you so keep much. it up. And we want to hear about more and more projects. I'm going to ask you after this, what's next? <laughs> well, what's next? That's a great project. Next is the history of Athens, uh, from the moment Athens became the capital of the modern Greek state, and this is going to be nine documentaries, nine exhibitions, and nine publications. Again, we've lost photographs and films from all around the world. Oh, wonderful, and, Maria. Uh, it will start first from the Benaki Museum, and then it will come also in the United States. Well, we're very happy. Don't miss out, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You better get to this sequel. Um, thank you, Maria, for being with us and sharing your wonderful work. Uh, and Again. we look forward to following more of your projects. On the island of Antiparos, at the heart of the Aegean, Gaia produced an exquisite organic olive oil in limited edition, which traveled all the way to the U.S. The sales of Antiparos olive oil will finance 10 new and innovative Greek companies to grow. Buy today your bottle in reinspiregreece.com and support the Greek youth to move forward. And here we are in downtown Manhattan. We're in the West Village, and we've come to Cornelia Cafe to check out some really cool poetry by some Greek Americans. It's a great event organized by the Greek American Writers Association. Let's check it out. I'm 
I'd like to welcome you to this program of special readings from Illuminations, the Greek issue of the International uh, Magazine of Literature. The bodies of stars will ascend out of sight. They are not for I will align the slant tooth of heaven. And happy the night may give no answers, but only let you walk through their unbroken bodies between the denseness of air. And we are with the coordinator of tonight's event, Penelope Cara George. She's done a wonderful job, great compilation. Tell us about tonight's event. Well, this is my first event as director of the Greek American Writers. So I was looking for something very special and this was it. The first Greek issue of Illuminations, international magazine. And it was really thrilling because the editor came from South Carolina and we had wonderful poets reading. And it was, you know, I think a terrific evening. The choices were great. What drew you to some of the work? I love, I write poetry, but I am very drawn to poetry that tells a story, has emotion, that when you read it out loud is meaningful and um, thrilling, you know, it reaches people. Some poems are, are better read on the page. But tonight we tried to pick poems that, in particular, that people could relate to. Thank I am first generation, but I am ashamed to say I go to Greece almost every summer, and my Greek language is minimal. But I, I heard your poetry tonight, and it was very moving. And I felt that you feel that you are part of Greece, and you are Greek, but you also feel like a stranger in Greece. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, it's always um, there's always that outsider. I mean, I love it so much, and I, I just love the people in the village, and of course I've known them now for many years. I'm still the American. In a strange way, I'm in a time capsule. I'm in my grandmother's house, and kind of relate to that. And when I see all the changes around me, the great big, like, McMansions going up, kind of hurts me. I, you know, I want to put it all in a bubble. It's not traditional anymore. It's modern. Not, not as much, no. But it's still there. There's really the essence. There is something about Greece and that village. I am the complaining Zenny, the American wife, the sweating mother, with my lopsided gait, holding panuli in perpetual hip bounce, my fingers flexing after Olive, who breaks my grip, heads for the platea steps again, her fuzzy hair like a memory of sun. There is shade, there is ouzo. And like every afternoon, we will walk up the hill at two for yemista, bacalao, or domades. Your father will negotiate the heat to breeze ratio of windows for maximum cooling, then threaten to purchase air condition. And now we're with Meg Scott Copsis, who's gonna tell us about her involvement in tonight's event. Oh, hi there, thanks. Yes, I'm the editor of Illuminations Literary Magazine, um, and we did a special Greek theme issue, uh, which I solicited lots of Greek American and Greek writers. Um, I'm married to a Greek, and so that's part of my interest in Greece, and I'm just happy to have gotten to work with some fantastic writers. And so some of your work is, in, is about Greece? Yes, I'm also a, a practicing poet uh, and editor, and I read a piece of mine this evening um, about a travel uh, arrangement in Greece and um, but most of my role with Illuminations has just been in editing and supporting Greek and Greek American writers. Well what's your experience as a foreigner traveling through Greece? Oh I feel pulled in two directions. Um, one is that I love the sensual beauty of Greece and I want to just run into the hills and dive into the oceans and do all kinds of just holiday oriented things. Um, the second sort of pull is that of family. My, my husband's Greek American and his family is, uh, lives in Greece. And um, the tradition is very strong and the ritual is very strong. So we have a lot of obligations with the family that don't always line up with our holiday plans. But that's what the Greeks are about. <laughs> that's what the Greeks are about. It's great being here this evening. Of course, I can relate to all of the nostalgia and 
the feelings of where do you belong? Are you Greek or are you American? And those wonderful summers I spent every year in, in Kalimnos, where my mother was from. And um, this is my boyfriend, Scott, who came one summer with me to Kalimnos. Who also an honorary experience. Greek. He's an honorary Greek, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, we both work in the film business and television business here in New York, and uh, very proud to be Greek. What, can I, what else can I say? How do you feel uh, having experienced Greece and being part of a little bit of the Greek community? Everybody should try it. Everybody should should uh, spend two or three weeks in Greece once in their life. Publish Greek and uh, Greek American literary and scholarly works. And uh, in the past, we've published an anthology of Greek American poetry called Pomegranate Seeds. Tonight, the Illuminations Journal, uh, they, did, they we had this event where they wanted to present some of the Greek work about Greece today, and they took excerpts and poems from various places, but including from Somerset Hall Press. So it really was a, my honor and privilege to be able to participate in this volume and bringing this together. And we are with Stefan Maros. He is a director, theater, and film, yes. a writer, and a poet. Stefan is also of Greek descent. He is third generation Greek. Tell us about tonight's uh, event. How do you feel to be here? Well, I love poetry. Um, the written word is still is it you know we are like monks without a monastery trying to keep the flame alive with all the high tech in the end it's the word that sings to the cosmos and i really believe in that it, it in theater you know that's still what we do i mean and um without words we would be we will be we'll revert back to the uh you know the neanderthal so anyway that's what i Did that's why i'm here did any of tonight's work bring back some nostalgia? I know you lived in Greece for a while. I was on the island of Amorgos for about five and a half months. And, um, in the 70s? In the 70s, What yes. a great time. Well, it was an interesting time. I was, as I said, I was the only Senos on the island. It was, I wanted to stay away from tourism. and um, It was a great place to write poetry, as a matter of fact. Um, and after that, I went to Rhodes and had a great time. Didn't tell anybody I was Greek. Cousin from Athens calling. You called me often at the end of, your, of my business day. Your cousin Chris from Greece, my office staff, announced you. It was at hours close to your midnight Athens when you closed the offices of the Greek Judo Federation with a bottle of Red Johnny Walker by your side. Your English words were slurred, slow, and forced in your attempts to pass as one of us and I recall the dynamic between us. I, the successful entrepreneur in the States, and you, the cosmopolitan Greek of many interests with worldwide connections. We are with the wonderful poet, Vasily Zruskas. Vasily, we love your work tonight. Tell us a little bit about how you feel to be here and to share your work with us. It is a wonderful feeling to uh, be in the midst of professionals, poets, scholars and be able to share a, a well-deserved uh, culture, the culture of the Greek-American poetry, the one that tries to incorporate life back in the old country and life here. And in that sense for me, although I have read before in uh, Cornelia Street Cafe two or three times, this was particularly special for me. On the outskirts of Queens, in the white room, the silver hands of lost time spin backward. From far off comes an immigrant, like almost all of us. He's happy for the divided night he left behind. He doesn't see the sucking body, the wire butterflies that sing sadly in his eyes. He doesn't see he's happy. He has forgotten the old wound. In the white room, the secret bird once stands for an instant on the window ledge and looks through the blurred pane with blindfolded eyes towards her gate. And we could not leave without speaking to Nikos Alexiou. I'm your biggest fan, Nico. I love your work. You're a great writer. You've published a book, Astoria. Tell us about tonight. Tonight, I think, it was a great event. It was a collaboration of the Greek American uh, writers and also the College of South Carolina. But they published uh, a literary issue on Greece. And I think 
as I said earlier, this is a political act because at the moment, uh, with great difficulty of, uh, of Greece, of our country, comes an American well-established uh, journal to provide Greece and hopefully alter this negative image of our country. Because I think we Greeks know how beautiful the country is and uh, we all hope and what you do, uh, your own work uh, with, the, with, the, with the channel and the station, uh, you want to you promote Greece. And, and I think uh, if the Americans understand that, uh, then it will be you know, a great leap forward. I think you said it best when you said that uh, many people, uh, the Philippines, they, they idolize Greece. Uh, yes, uh, it was a question about the, the marbles. Of the Elgin Martin. marbles. Yes, and, and I think this is it, uh, because you, uh, the Europeans, especially the Northern Europeans, uh, they have inherited our, our, our own culture as their own. So it's very difficult for them to separate from that. And this is um, a very difficult situation because we have to explain ourselves that we're not elephants. The same story happening with Macedonia. We have to explain to everybody that Macedonia is Greek. The same thing with the, with the, with, yes. with the marbles. So it is this dual relationship um, and, and ambivalent of, of love and hate uh, in the part of the Europeans uh, and Greece. After all, Greece right now, after 2009, it is the great experiment of Europe uh, once more. So I think this is very unfair. And we are prevailing. Of course. We hope to prevail. Of course. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and not only by saying it or, or, or just uh, eulogies, but, but also with, with actions, praxis, as, as this one, or, or what you do. So I think no, it's thank important. You. Uh, you guys filled the room tonight. There was also a lot of Philippines there. And a lot of the work was not only of Greek-American work. There was a lot of foreigners that have written poetry about Greece. Yes, and this is exactly uh, the point, that uh, Greece, because uh, theoretically it is um, a small literature, as they call it in the States, uh, on the other hand, it's so powerful. And, uh, and, and I think uh, through arts, through the arts, we, we, we can uh, uh, you know, un undo that and so, and so to the world, especially in the States, uh, who, who uh, really are modern Greeks, as uh, we have a continuity of language, a continuity of customs, a continuity of, of many, we live in the same landscape for all these years. As Durel said once, uh, other countries can, can give you a, a nice uh, landscape or a change uh, in manners, but Greece gives you something harder to know yourself. And, and I think this is what, what we do by, by trying to, to show our, our, our true modern Greek self. Να μην οι παλάμοι μας πάνω στη γη σαν ένα χωράφι Θα έρθουν οι φτωχοί και θα σπήρουν Θα χτίσουν οι άστεγοι Τα παιδιά τους φορώντας λευκές αλλαξιές Πιασμένα από τα χέρια όλα μαζί Θα μοιάζουν την άνοιξη πάνω από το χώμα μας Σαν μια αμυδιαλιά Καινούριο κατάστημα στην καρδιά της Αστόριας. Τσακίρις Μαλάς. Τα καλύτερα και τα πιο μοντέρνα υποδήματα άριστης ποιότητας από Ελλάδα, Ιταλία και Ισπανία. Το κατάστημα που εξυπηρετεί κάθε ανάγκη της σύγχρονης γυναίκας και του άντρα. Τσακίρις Μαλάς. 3143 Steinway Street, Αστόρια. Καθώς επίσης στο 7111 Austin Street, Forest Hills και 1206 Kings Highway, Brooklyn. Agape writes a memoir for life 
And Linda writes a spiritual fiction. And I am amazed at how similar these books really are. Agape, and I, I'm not gonna say the last name, it's hard to pronounce, but I'll try. Uh -huh. Agape <laughs> Stasinopoulos is an actress, an inspirational speaker, and she's also the author of Unbinding the Heart. She wrote this book, and it really is a collection of 32 stories that share everything about her life with her mom and her sister, and the stories are very wise and inspiring. Just thought it would be really nice if before we start to speak and share our stories with you, if we all celebrated the love that lives in all of us. And um, it's a very simple process if you would just join me. You can close your eyes, you can open your eyes, but it's really evoking the presence of love. You can take your right hand and put it in your heart your left hand, whatever feels right. And you can take your other hand and put it in the belly. That's where the center of our emotions lie. And if you would like to just take a deep breath and come really present in this room. And as you exhale, just exhale any Part of the day, they're just getting here, the bustle and the hustle of the day. And this time, as you receive your breath, allow yourself to receive it. I, I really do believe that everybody has a heart that longs to be shared, no matter who you are, what you do. And partly why I wrote this book is because I learned how to open up my heart and share it, meaning that I'm happy is the Greek language for, not, for love. And as a young girl, I was always trained, you know, from Greece to really share your love. So partly is I felt like tonight, both Linda, the other author who is wonderful, and I told our stories to touch people's hearts. And I really feel that it happened. You know, you could feel the energy in the room, you could feel people opening up, amazing stories that they shared. And I think it's like giving permission to people to say, share who you are, who you are is enough. What gives you your inspiration? What inspired you to write this book? You have many books, but this was most special. Well, th this is my heart. And uh, it's really, I wanted to tell my story and how I overcame what I overcame and all the little things that happened and didn't happen in my life really led me to one major thing, which is, myself and I really feel whatever happens in our lives or doesn't happen it's like really takes us in a spiral to find who we are because we all want to find who we are the sleeve of your book states Greek wisdom has been instilled in your story tell us about how your culture has influenced you in your life and career well the Greeks you know we have wisdom we have cafe we have the Greek chutzpah as we say we we have the celebration of life we have emotions and passion. And uh, my mother raised us like that, me and my sister Ariana. And then whatever we did, it was more like dare, dare to do what you need to do. And uh, that's what I find that, um, you know, you can't second guess yourself. You go after the things you love and, and you keep sharing yourself. And what happens is a miracle. Tell us a little bit about what you think is missing from the world that you can help fill in a gap? I, you know, I don't like focusing on what's missing because then if you have to keep focusing. But I want to say the world is a beautiful place if you keep allowing yourself to share what other people have to give and be authentic and true to yourself, authenticity. And that's part of, I think, what the Greek culture teaches us, be who you are. And I think there are many amazingly wonderful people in the world. And there are people who have their own journey and they don't want to share and they don't want to open up. And it's okay. You know, we're not here to get everybody to open up. We're, we're here to find our own tribe. If you have a project you want to do, do it. If you have an idea, just a spot and it's yours, go do it. If you have a book, write it. 
It doesn't matter if it will ever get published. Write it for your friends, for your children. If you have a song, sing it. Sing it in the streets, in the hospitals. People need your gift. People need your love. Don't wait for anybody. If you are with a man and he's not marrying you and he's on the fence, leave him on the fence. <laughs> and say, sweetheart, there are another 10,000 million like you. And go find the one who loves you. And if nobody loves you like you want to be loved, love yourself. Four months ago, um, I noticed myself becoming a better person in subtle ways. I was opening the door for people. I wasn't doing that elevator shady thing where you see someone coming and you press that button and you away and like, oh, I just didn't see you coming. I'm so sorry. I didn't know how you got here. And I noticed that I was becoming a better person because I was feeling secure for the first time. And that's something that I've noticed about myself and about other people that when you feel safe, it allows you to start being kinder to other people. And one thing that I aspire to, and this is a tough act to follow, but one thing that I aspire to is even when I don't feel safe and even when I don't feel completely secure as I don't right now, but I feel super vibrating in my bed, um, to be the best person I can be even when I don't feel that I'm tethered to a, a buoy. Well, um, working with Ariana and Agape is always a surprise. I came in here hoping to listen to Agape speak and hear some beautiful words of meditation and I ended up speaking in front of everyone, which I didn't expect. I ended up meeting a lot of really interesting people that I hope are going to blog for us, which should be wonderful. Um, and I came away with so much more than I bargained for, as this job has been. Have you read the book? What did the book bring into your life and what do you think is missing from our community that some of the things that Ariana and um, her, her sister Agapi are trying to bring to people? So I have had the pleasure of reading at least some of the book and I think part of it and what it has in common with Thrive is advocating for what's called the third metric which is about defining success beyond money and power. You would think the third thing would be would be sex but it's not. It's, um, it is a uh, spiritual and physical well-being. And that's what we're all about now, reforming the corporate world so that people can live healthy, meaningful lives. As an editor yourself, what is it, what kind of messages do you want to bring and what do you want your viewers to take from your words? I mean, a lot of what we publish, we publish everything conscientiously, so we're thinking about doing good with what we write. We're not representing every viewpoint equally, we're representing the viewpoints that are doing good and making progress in the world. What is it that you took from this event tonight? Well, I was inspired. You know, when I walked in here, I didn't know what I was walking into, but I find the circle of people that are speaking about humanity. And all of a sudden, I don't know where I get the courage, but she gave me the courage. That's the reason I stood up and I had to say hello to everybody. I had a mother, Ariana and I had a mother who passed 14 years ago, who saw in us our potential. And she saw the seeds, she saw who we were individually and completely unique. And she watered that with every fiber of her being. She watered it by never comparing us to each other. My sister was this extraordinarily, um, not, not, not A personality, triple A personality. <laughs> she was excelling at everything. Math, algebra. I thought math and algebra should not exist in the world. I prayed every night that my teacher would die. As if, as if, if my teacher died, they couldn't replace him. That's what my dream was. I hated it I, because I didn't understand it. But dance, theater, making people happy. So my mother used to say, darling, don't worry about math. We didn't bring you in this world to do math. We brought you here for the joy. So how I felt tonight was my heart opened completely. It was amazing to be in a group of people that um, I didn't know at all, but you could probably feel the energy building. You could really feel everyone's hearts opening. And it's like such a primal urge, I think, in all of us, that when we can get into a safe place, and really share some of our deepest fears, but also longings, and know that we're surrounded with people that care and want to hear what we have to say, wow. Like, that is phenomenal. So to really bring that, to me, it's like you've got to generate your own light. As you build your own light, and as you open your heart more and more, then 
you are. You're like, you know, Con Ed to the world. But let me ask you, how many people feel one of the most beautiful things in life is to be seen? And heard? And known? And don't we all just crave that as little children and boys and girls? We say, we want our parents to know us and to love us. And they do, but they also have their own stories and their own disappointments and their own struggles. So for me, I was very, very blessed. It was an incredible evening. I think what I'm taking away more than anything, I came expecting her to be wonderful. But what I'm walking away with is that New York City and our community is hungry for this. The work that I do is on the CEO leadership development level. It's everywhere. It's from an intern to a CEO. People are hungry and ready for change, for empowerment, for a new way of living and experiencing life. She nailed it on the head tonight. It was phenomenal. At some point, my mother said, a guy is going to go to RADA to study acting. Now, I needed a good teacher. So what do you think my mother did? I'm going to give you the, secret, the family secrets here. If you want to make something happen, you've got to ask. You've got to ask people who know people who can help you, okay? I wrote a blog on the Huffington Post. Please check it out, four magic words. Can you help me? Can everybody say that? Can you help me? You know why? Because when we ask for help, we open up the channels for love to come in, for help to come in. Let me hear it. Η φυσιοθεραπεία είναι ευθύνη. Απαιτεί επαγγελματισμό και σωστή μέθοδο. Στο Arista Physical Therapy έχουμε αυτό που χρειάζεστε. Επισκεφτείτε τι σύγχρονε εγκαταστάσει μα και ξεκινήστε άμεσα το πρόγραμμα φυσιοθεραπεία. Οι έμπειροι φυσιοθεραπευτέ μα είναι στη διάθεσή σα για να αντιμετωπίσουν τα προβλήματά σα. Παρέχουμε προγράμματα φυσιοθεραπεία, ενεργοθεραπεία, βελονισμού και άλλων μεθόδων ολιστική προσέγγιση. Arista Physical Therapy. Σα βοηθάμε να απαλλαγείτε από τον πόνο και να νιώσετε πάλι ζωντάνια. And with us today is the owner of Mondial Marketing, George Kurmuzis, an accomplished media guru who first worked in Montreal for four and a half years for PKF and KPMG management companies and was also a lecturer at McGill University. George Kurmuzis returned to Greece to introduce athlete and sports management to the nation. He later expanded in media ventures in Greece, Bulgaria and Romania. He is the largest provider of sports and entertainment programming in Greece and Bulgaria and represents ESPN, NBA, Paramount, Universal, BBC, ITV, A&E, and MTV, amongst others. George Kurmuzis played a major role in both the 1996 and 2000 Athens Olympic bids. George, welcome to New Greek TV, and nice welcome to, to New York. Nice to be here. I'm passing through from South Carolina back to Greece. You've had an amazing 35-year career. I don't know where to begin. Let's begin with 14 years ago with the Athens Olympics. <laughs> When you and I had the, yes, we That's had the right. good fortune of working together. Um, you set up the Olympic uh, broadcast entity that provided um, the games uh, throughout the world. Uh, let us know a little bit about what went on during those times. Uh, tell us about Greece then, the development, and where Greece is today. Well, my first involvement was um, with a 96 bid, which we lost uh, due to arrogance. I love that. Clearly. Uh, you know, sometimes we Greeks think that because the Olympics came from our country, uh, it's part of heritage. It is also part of our DNA and we can automatically organize them better than anybody else. This was not the case. But a serious effort followed in 2000, um, for 2004. Uh, it started in 1997. Uh, we won the Games and we delivered a beautiful product. Uh, however, however, the legacy of it was not well thought out. Uh, unlike uh, Barcelona, which had the games, used the games as an excuse to open the city to the sea and became the top destination for conferences and conventions. London, which developed its um, eastern docklands. I mean, Athens had no urban planning beyond actually bringing to fruition the infrastructural needs that the city had in terms of airport, metro, and highways. And that was an amazing gain because what the Olympics deliver are infrastructural projects on time. 
because you have to. Well, in the process, we, did in the, we not? We did. I mean, I mean. <laughs> you have to admit, Greece did it. They came through. We did. We did. This was this was great. And I, being you know living in Greece, I benefit from the Atikiodo and from a beautiful metro that is still expanding and a very nice airport. What happened with the follow through? We built stadia that we didn't need. We built facilities like the broadcasting center, which was my task in many ways, um, which we didn't need. That is now pretty much given away to, uh, to be a mall. Um, we did not take advantage of brand Athens, brand Greece, to try to capitalize on that, both internally and internationally. Was Greece ready to take on this task? Absolutely. I mean, my point during the bid uh, was that you cannot doubt that a, a, a capital of a, of a European Union nation cannot host the Olympic Games. And certainly we could. And whatever has been told about the costs, we have to be clear, there are two costs. There are the operational costs, mm -hmm. which were at 2.2 billion, which... The spending, you mean? The spending was 2.2 billion? No, the operational cost, which is to run the games, okay. which is to, to buy the equipment, to rent the stadia, to organize the games. Cost, I think, 2.3 billion, but that, that, that balanced out with the benefits, the revenues that we got from broadcasting rights, advertising rights, our local sponsorship rights, and so on. Then another 7 to 9 billion was spent on infrastructure. Now, we needed that infrastructure. It could have maybe we spend 30%, 40% more. But it was good for the country in Greece. general. But that's, the Olympics brought a lot of positive things to Greece. And oh, the Greeks came through. They brought, what I said is they brought needed, needed developments to uh, their completion on time because there was a target date. And they were finished and we still benefit from it. It did not bankrupt us. Okay, Spending 7 to 10 billion over a seven year period, a country that had a 230 million uh, euro GDP, it's less than half percent a right. year. So the multiplier just made up. And a lot of people would use that as an excuse. Well, it has been said that perhaps the Olympics were the, uh, you know, ignited perhaps the Greek economic crisis, but no, what it is ignited, your opinion on it? No, 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 no. What the Olympics did is that it, it gave, uh, it provided us with euphoria and being part of the Eurozone with a lot of borrowed money that instead of being spent further on capital investments like the roads and the airports and uh, the metro that we build, we borrowed to consume and we created a bubble. It's a bubble and that bubble burst. Now the one legacy, since we're talking about television and this is your TV station as well, is that setting up the Olympic Broadcasting Services, which was the first time that it was, you know, the games were centrally produced by uh, the Olympic Committee, uh, by the International Olympic Committee, I hired some Greeks and from ERT. And today, Olympic Broadcasting Services has been embedded into the International Olympic Committee as a service that comes automatically Along to the with, host country. Right. And this is the legacy because it is run. It is chaired by Yanis Exarchos. Oh, the CFO is Stefanos Kurelas, his classmate. That's wonderful. Uh, another two, me two members of the, of the board are, are Greeks. And I mean, that, so that that's legacy... that's a big legacy. You know, but we did not create enough legacies. You developed that infrastructure. It, it, it stayed, and that's, uh, you know, yeah. an important uh, then part we're of the into Olympics. The wall. What is your opinion on how Greece is moving in to um, the future with all of these uh, debts that have been accrued? Well, uh, we've had one haircut. Uh, the math says that we need to have another haircut. Now, when... Will this haircut take place? It depends on, on the, the global politics and mostly the European politics. Um, look, it's like a family that got into debt, like it happened here in 2008. So take Greece as a family that got into debt. Exactly. And so what, what, do you, what, do you do? what do you do to pay back your debts? Or what do you do, first of all, to live? I mean, you need to you cut fiscally costs. <laughs> cut costs. So what has been achieved after a lot of pressure by the Troika is that Greece cut enough of its costs cut costs, did not restructure, and I want to underline that, so that there is enough money to create, uh, to create a surplus, uh, a primary surplus. But that means that a lot of people are starving in the process. A lot of people are unemployed in the process to create that, that surplus, and that is not sustainable. That is not sustainable. It what, is not sustainable. What's going to happen? How are they well, going what to What is sustainable, and what, what uh, 
what the Troika has said, because they came in to advise us and because actually now to enforce us, to enforce certain measures, was were structural reforms. Right. But structural development. We are a country that is known for resistance, which we'll be celebrating <laughs> in a few days. And our politicians, some of us included, even though I do admit that he's doing a much, much better job of managing than anybody else has before. He's a hands-on prime minister. He has minister. proven it, definitely. He has proven it. He's, he, you know, he's a good hope. Um, is that they are, even he is refusing to heed to structural reforms that may cost the parties votes. And he has these parties coming along, which are, which are the unions, which are the, the trade unions, the, the oligopolies of truckers and taxi drivers and this and that and the public servants. In the process, we're protecting and we're catering to the vote of the public servant by not firing 2,000, you know, crooks. And we have put, you know, one and a half million private individuals out of a job. And I don't understand how the math does not reach them that these people are going to vote against the government and they will vote in opposition for somebody that may not necessarily represent any hope but is the dissent vote. What do you think it's going to take for Greece to stand back up on her own two feet? Change attitude. What type of change? Accept the structural reforms that will make the country more competitive. Once you become more competitive, you can go out and sell product and services and make some money out of it. If you expect to be saved by the Greek gods, you know, because you happen to be Greek and Greeks are the most clever, the but you know, the crap that we we sell, we self advertise. It is not so. What Greece is, is clearly a nation, a country that, that is blessed uh, by, by the earth, the climate, the sea. I mean, Greece, as you know, has the average earth's climate and the, the, the morphology of mountains and waters and, 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 and the sea and the islands. I mean, this is why Greece has been so desirable, because it makes it makes for easy living. It's perfect. Still it's easy living. Maybe we, yeah. we live too easily. <laughs> we it's didn't labor thing, out there. I think that what is going to happen to the new generation? What can the government do to create jobs, to create uh, incentives for businesses, uh, to perhaps provide uh, some fi funding for startups? Uh, you know what? We should not always look at the government to provide. The government should provide a net. The government should provide incentives for, for the unemployed or for the generation that is leaving us again um, to stay and create by giving it an opportunity to do so. I mean, you hear things, Yana, I mean, it, it's really silly. Suddenly, we announced, there was an announcement that you can get um, a permit to open a business in one day. Wow. You say, no kidding. In one day, provided that you have accumulated the following 27 pistopitica, you know, certificates, which may take you three months. Right. But if you accumulate all of that, then you can, ready to go. you can apply and get a permit in one day, and then they will check if your right. uh, certificates and whatever A lot are, of red but, tape. But this is... A lot of red tape, and, and it seems that that red tape <coughs> is not ceasing to exist. No, but. no, because that red tape employs people. Those people that are employed are the public servants. The public servants vote. And we are uh, hostages that, yeah. of, of the public service and, and the political balance. We are in a transition period. Right. Let's see what happens. And a lot of these politicians, I mean, you count them as friends. They're friends of yours. You've went to school with them. You've graduated abroad. You are one of the Greeks that had the luxury of studying abroad, and you spent a lot of years here. Tell us a little bit about uh, your, uh, the politicians that are into power today. How healthy is the political arena? Well, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, later day philosopher, I think he lived in New York, um, stated that his worst nightmare is to wake up one day and find that his country is run by his classmates. Um, that's what I... That happens to be your case right now, George. <laughs> but the Greeks that have studied abroad, they go back with new ideas and a different type of You do. I went, I went uh, back. Okay, I went back. I, I was in the same prep school. I mean, for 10 years with Antonis Samaras and George Papandre. We are friends. We know each other. I dated Luca Cazzelli when I was in high school. I don't uh, know if she wants her people to know. She that. does. We're still friends, and you know we hang out, my sister and so on. Uh, and you know we came here and we came back. We came back to, to build something, to create something, and and you know oh we also came here went to the same schools, you know in Massachusetts at Amherst. So you just said it. You all came back 
to create to something. Greece. And what is it? You might be, you guys are the future of Greece. Um, you know, some, a businessman can create something novel and, 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 and uh, the legislation will follow, like laws follow the internet. Uh, but but you, know, you changed I create, television. I create, you no, changed, I changed sports. You not changed television. sports and you also brought a lot of programming to Greece from the History Channel, Discovery Channel. I professionalized, Channel. I, I made, I turned sports into uh, an entertainment, uh, entertainment content. Content. I started the Athens Marathon. Back in 78, I got involved with the Olympics, uh, European basketball, football, exactly. soccer, whatever. So Greece so I will did that. change. Greece has but changed. It did. And it it's happened. proven. It and happened. it's proven. George and, George and Andonis uh, came into political systems which they had the possibility to change. Andonis tried, and he was ousted because the politics were stronger than him, if you remember, back in early 90. Um, George had the ideas, but he didn't have the means. Plus, he inherited... Uh, a dinosaur and you cannot ride a dinosaur so he didn't have the means or maybe the you have to the change know how I mean you have up. ideas I mean to say I told you so means nothing but you need to put them it. into action yeah I think the system didn't allow it even though if I don't know what Andonis is going to do but if George was stronger he could have done it I think uh, the prime minister is doing it slowly well you know there is they some both changes. they both fell upon a very difficult situation that required very gussy decisions. It required upending the boat completely. You know, it's a creative destruction. But it's not basically. only with Greece. It is with, the, it is with the world. The United States went through it. Europe's going through it. Argentina went bankrupt. Portugal, Italy, Ireland. These are bankrupted uh, countries that people don't really talk too much about. So these uh, politicians have inherited uh, these changes. And of course, uh, the way the system was structured brought them to where they are today. Yeah, well, you said that Portugal and other countries have also uh, fared uh, poorly recently. We have fared more poorly than them. I mean, I'm glad I don't live in the Ukraine, even though I did business in the Ukraine. I mean, there is worse than that. Uh, however, you know, I'm not going to see the... You see, the, the problem, the basic problem is that if your goal in life is to go back to the days that went past, that basically bankrupted you, that is not a vision that is not a future and this is what our politicians are kind of promising um, like I said there's gonna have to be a haircut and a change a change of uh, of attitude um, and maybe the the, 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 the the elections the midterm elections that are taking place municipal and, and EU elections will send a message that would enable some of the politicians to move forward and make the required changes but anyway um, and what are you doing these days, George? You fly to the United States. You still have bonds here. You worked in Montreal uh, for many years. You yeah, I well, I I'm one of those people that came here to study. You know, got my BS, my MBA, worked in Canada, became a Canadian citizen, went back to Greece. Uh, my wife is called Ann Turner. Uh, we have a place in South Carolina in Beaufort. I have a son and three grandchildren in Maryland, and a daughter and two grandchildren in Athens, Greece. I go back and forth. Perfect. And I, uh, Best of both I, I am an entrepreneur, so I still find a few things to do. And actually, recently I talked to, uh, had some preliminary talks with uh, the bid committee for the Washington uh, 2024 Olympic Games effort to see maybe I can offer them some ideas. I, I also have my, my own little things, having slowed down since. But, uh, Time to enjoy life, George. You've done a lot. Well, I've done a lot. The problem is that my assets and my investments in Greece are not going to provide for my retirement anymore. And that is an issue that I don't want to discuss. <laughs> so, and that's, and that's, that's a tough reality. Yeah, I'm going to take the plane and go back and see. That many people that have worked so you know, many years are not going to be able to sustain their lives. And it's all relative, you know, because somebody that makes less money than me and some people that make more money than me, we all have the same relative problem because we're being hit at every level. So... Well, we wish you good <coughs> luck. We are here, Greeks abroad, to support Greece and give out as much information as we can to, uh, to the Greek diaspora. To the diaspora well, it is important. What you do <coughs> is, is of great importance to keep uh, the Greeks <coughs> excuse me, informed about what is going on back there and give them some inside stories. And I, I'm glad that I provided part of that today. George, give our viewers uh, some insight on what they should be expecting from the news back home. 
The news is not going to be good. Um, the news is going to be the same. It's just, you know, when you get bad news, you react in the beginning, uh, and then you kind of get used to it. Um, you, you know, we're not in denial anymore, but maybe the new news is going to be that another haircut will take place in 2014. Uh, the, uh, the voters are going to look for some strong leadership, and Samaras is going to take that on uh, with some technocrats and, and, and forget their personal agendas and look at the Greek agenda. We wish everyone good luck. We're here to support. Thank you so much for being here with us and giving us all this wonderful information uh, and the reality of things, which uh, people do want in the diaspora to know the truths, what's going on abroad. Everybody's worried and everybody wants to do what they can. But uh, we'd like to thank you, and that brings us to another closure of Calimera USA. Thank you so much for being with us today, and look out for more Calimera USA coming to you next week with some more successful Greeks.